Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Growing up spiritually, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting, or better stated, the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, or again, mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted, by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so um, we find out here, he says that he, he wants us to grow up, that he wants to be children, that he wants to remain children. And so we understand that, there's a, that we can go from being a child to being mature. And that is called, we, we grow spiritually. Some people have taught, you know, when you get born again, you're fully grown and mature and all that. And there's just too many scriptures that, that violate that. Uh, actually, um, as a matter of fact, when I was at Ramah, Dad Hagen had a book out called Growing Up Spiritually. And we had a, a teacher in the classroom teaching that you were already uh, mature and fully grown. And he didn't last, that, that was his last year there. Uh, he's, in the, he's in the classroom teaching exactly the opposite of what Brother Hagen's book was, <laughs> was out there on the table saying. And we had that book as part of our, our uh, textbooks. So, uh, no, we grow and the first stage of spiritual you know, growth is when you're born, you're a baby. And just like physical, there's a lot of parallels in the scripture uh, between physical growth and spiritual growth. And the, the physical growth is often used as an allegory of spiritual growth. So let's look at 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Um, 1 Peter. That is not to be confused with 2 Peter. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. And I'm over second Peter. Just told y'all not to confuse him. And I said, no, that's not the scripture. Okay. Uh, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So notice that the, the Bible does recognize that, we, that you can be a newborn babe in the Lord. And you're not eating meat. You're, eating, you're drinking milk. Uh, you're... you're um, Babies drink milk. They don't, you don't shove a steak down a, a three-day-old's mouth. I mean, you can't even chop it up and mincemeat it for them. They're just on milk because they're babes. Their body can only handle that at that time. And um, so let's talk about three different characteristics of spiritual stage of babyhood. Okay? Innocence. Number one, they're very innocent. They're not tainted by the, by the hurts or the hypocritical things they run into or the people who've done evil things in the body of Christ. They're just, they're wide open. They believe, they believe everybody's as sincere as they are without the Lord. They just believe it, you know. So, which we, we hate to lose that, but you know, people over time end up, many times do. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or a new species of being that never existed before. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, in this, we find out because we're new creations, we're born again. Uh, the new babe is um, innocent before God. It's, you know, really, this is a characteristic we shouldn't outgrow. And that takes work. As you get older and people do stuff, it takes effort with the Word of God to maintain your innocence because you get tainted by other people. Third, um, as a babe, you know that you just, you just <laughs> feed it to me. Now, we understand you've got, you got a right to divide the, divide the Word of Truth, but don't, we, we can't ever get the know-it-all attitude. People who get out of the babyhood stage and start thinking they know everything get a know-it-all attitude a lot of times. They think they know everything. I remember um, um, as, as a, uh, at some stage of my Christian growth, you thought, man, I got it all. I know everything. There's nothing I don't know. <laughs> kind of like a teenager, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get to that point where, you know, mom and dad are just stupid, and by the time you get to 30, it's amazing how smart your mom and, got, mom and dad got in that 10 years. You can't, can't even fathom how much intelligence my mom and dad gained over the last 10 years. Hallelujah. Um, and it, but in that innocence remain teachable. Okay. Second is ignorance. They just don't know anything. Babies don't know. They, they, they don't know. If you put, if you put 
if there's something on the floor, an old piece of ham or cheese that's moldy or whatever, they go, they're, they're going to put it in their mouth. It could be poisonous to them. They don't know any better. Okay? Hebrews 5.14 says, Strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Meat is for those who are of fully, not for babies. Okay? Don't go giving a baby some, you know, heavy duty, heavy revy that they can't even fathom. I mean, listen, about the only thing, they don't even understand what the new birth was about. You're going to come teach them about, you know, um, you know, the Merrimos or, you know, some crazy stuff where that's just so deep they can't even, they just, huh. Okay. All right. Babies don't know any better than to swallow anything. Bad teaching or doctrine. That's why we are to disciple them in Christ. Okay? Um, because they can get a hold of bad stuff in a hurry, and they won't know the difference. They won't know that it's good or bad. That's why when the babies come into the kingdom, you've got to watch over them. You've got to guard them. You've got to protect them. And they've got to be a shepherd over them. The pastor has to be a shepherd over them. And uh, keep them away from stuff that's going to be harmful or damaging to them. People get mad at me. I've had people leave the church because I, w- I, I won't let bad teaching go undealt with. They say, <laughs> they got all kinds of mouthy stuff to say. But the fact of the matter is I got people in the congregation with all kinds of spiritual stages, and I got, I got babes out there who can get caught in that stuff and destroy them. I mean, and destroy them before they can get recovered. Um, and, and you just can't let it go. Well, you, yeah, you, got, you, know, you just got to walk in love. You got to teach love, 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 love. Well, you, you, be stupid. You know, you're not responsible for it. As a, you're not the pastor. You can just sit out there and say what the world, put you on your little hippie gown and get the flowers in your hair and start singing what the world needs is love, sweet love. No. Love, sweet love. All right. That's enough. So they're ignorant. They're ignorant. So we have to, you know, that's, that's a characteristic of baby stage. Third, irritability. They're easily spoiled because they become irritable when they don't get their way. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> you got to be weaned. We, like Dad Hagen says we, got, we don't have any room in the spiritual nursery because there's been people in there for 25 years and won't get out. Yeah, exactly. They're still wanting to be bottle fed and changed all the time. You know? <laughs> you know, he had, a, had a, la- a lady in his church. He had a couple of old ladies in his tr- one of his churches at one time. And um, they, they would, um, you know, they just stay out of church a couple of weeks. And he, he had to go visit them, you know. And um, finally he figured out what they were doing. And, uh, and he just wouldn't go visit them. And they finally, finally he sent word one day when he was going to come visit them. He said, I ain't coming to visit you. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be helping get people disciples in Christ. Instead, you're sitting in the spiritual nursery expecting me to come take care of you. And they kind of straightened up and came to church. Exactly. It was just them throw, be, be, wanting to be bottle fed and be changed and be, you know, have all this attention and all this kind of stuff. If they don't get it, they get mad and leave. Uh. <laughs> Called employees. <laughs> <coughs> weaning has to take place. Weaning is a joyous day, but as most parents have probably found out, it's usually a protesting day. You wean the baby, and it starts protesting. It won't eat, it won't do this, it won't do that. It just throws fits. Shannon was, was my biggest fit thrower. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Two. <laughs> just, just declaring the truth. Yeah. Fit thrower. And uh, too many Christians are like that today. They like the nursery and the bottle and the diapers. Okay? But that's, this is babyhood stage. The thing is, we've got to grow out of these stages. Or help, and, we gotta, and our job is to help people grow out of these stages. But you've got to be weaned. Okay? Psalm 131, 2 says, Surely I behaved and quietened myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There are Christians who just flat out throw hissy fits when it's time for them to step up to the plate and, and get out of this babyhood stage. Because they expect the pastor to be there and the pastor to, you know, and, and, to, and just to cater to their every little whimper and whine. And um, <coughs> it's got to be their way or the highway. And that, that means them leaving and going down the highway. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of weird to have, be able to take a spiritually babe inside of a mature, grown body and have them throw their fists. They can get up and walk out, you know. And... Uh, uh, and then they call me back and blame me. Yeah, yeah that's my fault. Uh, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Genesis 21, 8. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast that same day that Isaac was weaned. Okay? Babies don't like to be weaned. 
babies in churches. Like, they don't like to be weaned. They don't like, a lot of times they don't want to step into the next stage of developing responsibility. This is where we got the term cruisomatic. Now, we had charismatics who wouldn't stay in a church. They'd run from whoever's in, like in Tulsa was really bad because you had all these big churches. And, the, and this week, Fred Price would be over here. Next week, Kenneth Copeland would be over there. The following week, Jerry Savelle would be over here. And then this week, you know, Creflo Dollar or so, somebody would be all over Tulsa. And they always just run around to the different meetings. And this is a lot of baby history. They're always running to a different meeting and never sta getting stable or staying anywhere and maturing and growing because they're, they're constantly getting just fed, just, just, oh, yeah, they just get, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, uh, and they go sit in the church, and the pastor says, okay, now take what you learned and go do something with it. I ain't going back there no more. They want me to do something. Now, you know, or they, didn't they didn't preach I can have what I say. Or they didn't preach I'm going to get the hundredfold return. They didn't preach, you know. And um, people think you can, you, you can run a church like you run a traveling ministry. You can't. The traveling minister gets to come in, and um, he gets to uh, have a message or, you know, five messages or whatever he preaches all year everywhere he goes. And I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to slam the trial minister. That's their ministry. They have a message, you know, that, something that's in their heart to share with the body of Christ. And they may share that same message all year, everywhere they go. You can't run a church like that. I can't preach the same message 52 uh, weeks a year. You got to preach stuff like, you got to grow up. And see, so babes don't like that. They want to they be able just to go get that, that, you know, go get the milk, go get, I mean, like, you know. Uh, it's time to eat, you know, where you got to cut up your steak and chew it. No, 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 no. I want chocolate milk. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, I want chocolate milk with, uh, you know, chocolate ice cream or something. You know, I want to, I want to have a chocoholic overdose. No, you got to have some meat. You can't just live on that. Okay. And they're easily frustrated, distracted. They get hurt real easy. You know, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to hurt a baby Christian. You can look at them wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. The next stage of growth is childhood. Like the Ephesians says, we'll be no more children. Now, childhood stage is different. Children are unsteady. You know how they start walking, you know, they become toddlers. They're, they're, not, they're not real steady on their feet. And you're just kind of watching them, you know, boom, 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 And they get to the couch and they stop. They never fell over. You know, but if, they, if it wasn't the couch for there, eventually they'd be going down because they just, they got that momentum going and they had to front run into a couch or something to stop them. Okay. A child cannot be readily relied upon to carry out tasks. Uh, if another opportunity comes along to do something more exciting, they're gone. Totally gone. Like Baloo. I'm gone, man. Totally gone. All right? I mean, and that, that's the way children are. You know, they're, they're, in the, you know, they're in the church. And, oh, Pastor Ed, we love you. You're the greatest church. It's the most wonderful church I've ever been in in my life. But I got an opportunity to go over to such and such church and do this. It's more exciting, you know? Uh, they had the rock climbing wall. They had, you know, they get, they get to be in, you know, some people put people in charge of stuff that, you know. I, I'm, I just get amazed at churches that bring people in and start putting them in charge of stuff, letting them speak into the congregation, and they are not prepared. They're not ready, you know, um, and all that kind of stuff. Prophesying. You know, listen, you, anybody can be using the gifts of the Spirit, but, you know, bringing people up and setting them in a place that's meant to teach and teach the body of Christ, you're not supposed to be a, you're not supposed to be a novice doing that. You're supposed to be mature. Okay, but people will bring, uh, they had, um, um, back in, uh, when the girls were out in Oklahoma, a church started pretty near Rhema Bible Church, like I think in the shadow of it. That's how close it was. When the, when the certain, sun was in a certain direction, the shadow hit the building. I mean, it was close. That's a little extreme, but I mean, it was like less than half a mile. And, uh, but Rhema students would go over there. They'd say, oh, you're a Rhema student. I want you to be on my worship team next week. Right. Automatic. automatic. Well, there's a lot of Rhema students that ain't mature. <coughs> I can tell you that. I mean, I went to school with them. Uh, when I first got there, I was one of them. <laughs> I was. I was. I was. I was a cares nut bake, nutcase. Okay. I was just crazy for Jesus, but I wasn't mature. I needed to grow. You know? Rhema or bust. That's what I put on my car. Rhema or bust. Hallelujah. Um, uh, they 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 start out doing a task. They get distracted, forget their responsibilities, quit. You know. You know, because that's what children do, you know. That you're, all right, honey, you've got to clean your room up. So they're, they're just doing this, and all of a sudden they see a toy. Next thing you know, they're over there with a the toy for the next four hours. Or Jesse. Jesse. Have her in her room. She'd be doing something. You know, have her in her room doing something. And, and next thing you know, she's screaming because she took the little shaft off the little lamp that, you know, where the, the, the electric prods ran up and touched it because she was always investigating something. <laughs> I mean, she was an investigator. <laughs> Oh gosh, she she invested she and she used 
She used every medium of art you can think of, including diapers. And we'll leave that one there. Okay. They're curious. They, children are curious. They want, they, they want the latest gossip. Who, what, where, what, huh? Okay. Uh, they don't like... They, they, they don't, and they don't like knowing what someone else is doing. In other words, they don't like, I'm sorry, they don't like not knowing what someone else is doing. They, they want to be in the know. They're going to miss something. And let's just say it. They're just plain old nosy. Okay, children, and we get that in the church. You know, they're just nosy. All right? And they're talkative. Now, Proverbs 10, 19 says, In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that, is, that refraineth his lips is wise. In other words, if you keep your mouth shut, you stay out of trouble. Children don't know how to do that. Hello? Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, A dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of his words. Overly talkative people are usually guilty of three sins. One, evil speaking. That's talking about and discussing the faults of others. Vain speaking. Always talking about yourself. And then foolish speaking. <coughs> jesting and joking that are not convenient. Too much jesting. And joking. It's all right. To, we kid around. That's okay. But there are people who can't talk serious. They're always joking. They're always cutting it. They can't be serious about anything. They're unable to carry on a spiritual conversation. Always have to be cutting up and joking. Now, Ephesians 5, 4 says, Neither foolishness, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Our mouth should be used for the declaration of spiritual things. Okay? It's okay to have fun. But it's, you know, um, and, and really foolish jesting is when you start getting into things that are just, that aren't right. I mean, you got Christians telling jokes now they shouldn't be telling. You know, talking ways they shouldn't talk, uh, acting ways they shouldn't act. Hello. And um, so let's look at the next stage: manhood or adulthood stage of spiritual growth. What do what do adults do? Number one, as a Christian, we esteem spirit, uh, earthly things lightly. They're not the most important thing in the world. Okay. Hebrews eleven. Look over there, starting verse twenty four through twenty six. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteem, now listen, he chose not to be called. What did that mean to be called Pharaoh's daughter? He had access to everything in that kingdom. Everything in Egypt was at his disposal. Because he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But he refused to be called that. Um, he went to suffer the affliction of God's people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. It's not wrong to have earthly things, but it's wrong to, so, for them to have you. Okay? You have to esteem earthly things lightly in the light of heavenly things. Now there are people. And, and this is where some of the prosperity teaching gets off or is misused or misconstrued because people begin to think about being filthy rich, just to say it that way, you know. I mean, they watch Robin Leach and the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, you know, and they, they, they go to the prosperity seminar, the prosperity meeting, next thing they know, they're thinking about yachts and, you know, and, you know, uh, and they start going around saying things, well, if the world can have it, I can have it, you know, and that kind of stuff. And what happens, you begin to esteem, you begin to put your treasure in a different place. The world goes after all those things in the amount and the way that they do because they esteem earthly things greater than godly things. And we get caught up in that, and we begin to justify pursuing them at all costs because I'm a child of God. I actually had the same thing. Well, if you're esteeming heavenly things greater, you're more concerned about advancing the kingdom. You're more, you're more focused on growing in Christ. You're more focused on making sure that the, the, there's money in the kingdom of God than you are building your own kingdom. Okay? And, and having, be, being like Bill Gates. You know, well, the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. And we've we kind of gotten off on some things where it's so much about us having super wealth that we forget that we're supposed to be pursuing the kingdom. And see, when you become an adult in the Lord, that's, those things begin to fall by the wayside. You know, yeah, I could have the, the $300,000 Lamborghini, but you know what? I can drive a $60,000 car and, and put 240000 into the kingdom and build churches and, and send out missionaries and do this and do that. Um, 
And, and, and listen, it's not because you're manipulated into it. It's not because you're forced into it. But because you're an adult and the Lord, you realize there are more important and more valued things than you driving a car for status, a certain status mobile. Okay? And so you, you come to that point. And, and we grow to that. You don't get there as a baby. Babies don't do that. Well, I mean, our children don't do that. Children, you know, I mean, children can, you can have a big talk with them about, you know, the children in China don't have anything and taking the toys of us, and they don't even think about China, except that it was made there. Okay? I mean, they want everything they see, everything on the shelf, everything. They, you know, that's, but see, when you get become an adult, you can go into place and go, well, I don't need that. You know? I mean, how many more uh, uh, televisions do I need? Now, my mother-in-law has a, a television a addiction. And if she can't buy her one, she buys the kids one. I have one. Uh, now I have two. Nope, no, no. She gave us money for that one in the bonus room. Um, I have one television in my house that I bought straight out. <laughs> All those came from my mother-in-law buying, giving them for Christmas presents or whatever. Because she just loves to do that. And I'm like, okay, Miss Glisten, I, I, I get it. So, you know, I've got 26 inch up on the ceiling. I mean, 32 inch up on my bedroom ceiling. Ain't down at the bed, and it's up in the tray, so it's in the slanted part of the tray ceiling. You know, I got, I got a 50-inch downstairs. That's the one I bought, you know. And then I got a 55-inch up in the bonus room. I uh, got, you know, I mean, all given because <laughs> that's what she does, you know. I'm not going to go out and buy an 80-inch television. Why do I need another television? I don't need another one. You know, I don't, I really don't. I, you know, I enjoy, yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy watching the ball game last night. Really, I wouldn't, have, no, I wouldn't have enjoyed it on the big screen last night if they had lost. But because they won, I enjoyed it. But when you become an adult, things, certain things become more important. And you, be, you begin to esteem, not esteem them at all, but you begin to esteem th earth things lightly. They don't, they don't carry the weight and value uh, that, that they once did when you were a babe. Okay? You begin to grow. You begin to understand that things are more important. Okay, um, so you have, to, you have to esteem them lightly in, in the light of heavenly things. Secondly, you become dead to censure or praise. Okay, in other words, being censured by people, rebuked or slammed, or being praised by people don't affect you. They don't lift you up, they don't pull you down. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 4, 1 Corinthians 4 3 and 4, says, But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing of myself. Yet am I not hereby ju justified? But he that just judges me is the Lord. Paul didn't really care what people thought about him. Either way. Okay? I'm getting, I, I'm actually getting there. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a place where, you know, people... Um, who've left the church or people, this kind of stuff, they, they tell you things and all this kind of stuff, or they come back later and they tell you all kinds of stuff. You know, you're at the point like, okay. Yeah. Oh, you're a, you are a wonderful pastor. Okay. You're a lousy pastor. Okay. Exactly. You know, you get, you get to the point where, you, you know, you, you come to a point that what they say doesn't really have any bearing or weight on who you are and what your calling is and what God has for you to do. You become mature in that place. So they go, oh, you were just a great pastor. We, we went here, but you were a great pastor. Okay, you know, or, you know, you're a jerk. Okay, yeah, whatever. I'm serving God, you know, hallelujah. Okay. Um, baby Christians are self-conscious. Mature Christians are God-conscious. Baby Christians is all about them, about their world. Mature Christians are about God and his world. Okay. Um, and then mature Christians are able to recognize God at work. Uh, Genesis 45, verses 5 and 7, not 5 through 7, but 5 and 7. Now, therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye, ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. This is talking about uh, Joseph. Remember, his brother sold him, and, uh, but then he, now he's, he's become made second in all of Egypt, and they've come to him, and uh, he's revealing himself to them. And he says in verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Now, uh, he got himself into a heap of trouble. And his pride got in there, see? But he had grown up, matured, and now he, he understood God had a plan for him to be able to deliver his whole his family, which became the whole nation of Israel. And told them, don't be worried about it. Don't worry about the fact you sold me into slavery. You know, I lied to daddy and told him that I was you know, killed. Uh, now the whole family's saved, okay? 
Let me ask you this question now. What man or a man or woman are you, spiritually speaking? 1 Corinthians 10, 32 says this. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, neither to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now, I'm going to make a statement that the, some people don't like to hear. There's only three races of men according to God. The Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. The natural lineage of Abraham, okay? Uh, the people who are outside, the who are not saved, and outside the natural lineage of Abraham. In other words, they're neither a Christian nor they're a Jew. They're Gentiles, okay? So you have the natural lineage of Abraham, which is called the Jew. Then you have the unsaved non-Jew, which are referred to as Gentiles. And then he has the church of God, okay? Those are the three races of men. That's it. All right? The Jew, the Gentile, or the heathen, um, and then the church of God. The word always also shows us that all mankind's spiritual status falls into one of three categories. So we've got three categories of spiritual status. Natural, unsaved. He is an unspiritual physical man. You're not born again. You don't have the life of God. And you, and you, can't, you can't make the application of what you put on a Christian on an unsaved person. We're to call them to repent and get saved. You can't get them, well, stop doing this and stop doing that. You can't get them to stop. That's what they do. They're unsaved. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Oh, well, that's true. They receive not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So he's not a spiritual man. He's motivated by his flesh, by demons operating in the flesh. He's ruled by Satan, not necessarily possessed, but they're influenced. He's influenced. See, unsafe people are influenced by demonic power. They not, may not have devils in them, and they don't turn their head around backwards and, you know, have, throw the priest out the window like in the exorcist or whatever. You know, and all the kind of, you know, the crazy stuff that Linda Blair did. I knew people who actually, I, knew, I met some people when I was at a baseball academy in Florida that, that were from her hometown that knew her. And said so she was a weird kid after that movie. She became, a, because it just affected, she became a really weird, weird person from being the star of The Exorcist. You know, they had her head spinning around backwards in the movie and speaking with a man's voice and all that kind of stuff. I knew a lot was done in post-production, but still, she, she got something on her. And, um, yes, yeah, sir. Okay. So, but, you know, unsafe people are not spiritual people. I hear people talking all the time. Oh, they're so spiritual. They're not even a, they're not a believer. They don't have the life of God in them. And, they, and they're spiritual, but they're devil spiritual. All right? Uh, they are motivated by Satan. They're motivated by inf demonic influences. Um, Romans 8, 7, and 9 says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. Okay? The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh... But in the Spirit, if so be, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You have to have the life of God in you. Everybody said the life of God in me. If not, you're carnal-minded. And a carnal-minded man and a carnal-minded woman. Oh, okay. A carnal-minded man and a carnal-minded woman. Hallelujah. Well, well, I'll wrap this up soon so you don't miss much. How about that? But we're going to get this on the Internet. We'll start getting, we're going to start getting the Winston stuff on. Okay. All right. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And so uh, you've got to get rid of the carnal mind. You've got to become born again in order to get rid of the carnal mind. If you don't, you can't get rid of it because that's, you know, there's no way to get rid of it in, in an unsaved person. Um, they gain knowledge from their senses. They can't get revelation knowledge. The only thing that the unbeliever can believe is that Jesus, God gives them the faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you raised him from the dead. He's been dealt that much faith, and when they, when they hear that, they can act on that. I remember a number of years ago, back when um, there was a guy named Morton Downey Jr., who was on late night, and call, they called him the mouth, and he, would just, and he would just scream at people. And I mean, well, he had on his show, I don't know if you remember a number of years ago, up in here, the Mayadin. There's that little kid up in May, and then he, he would stand there and scream at his principal's window. His dad would go out on the street corner and scream at the cars. Ye generation of vipers and snakes, prepare the way. I mean, he would just, and his son would go get up under the principal's window at the school and scream the same stuff to the principal. Well, Morton Downey Jr. had him on television. And then he had this little, 
this little white kid with an afro in the tuxedo who had a healing ministry, you know, and that kind of stuff, you know, and quote, quote, quote kid preachers. They're just being marketed about the people. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> and um, I remember that he looked at the kid who had the, quote, healing ministry. Can you heal me? Can you heal them? Can you heal somebody? Somebody, come, somebody here in the audience, come up here. Yeah, heal them. And he starts talking to him about having faith and believing that God can. And I said, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. If they're not saved, they can't, they don't, they just, you know, they're not even, they're not in covenant, they're not even in covenant. They don't even have an Old Testament covenant. They're just Gentiles. And you're telling them to believe. Okay? You're trying to get them to believe, which, you, you know, which they're not even really equipped to believe that you have a healing ministry. <coughs> and um, I mean, it just stood out to me really strong. Yeah. So unbelief, unsaved people, natural people, don't walk by faith. They gain all their information about what they see, what they hear, what they taste, what they feel, um, what they smell, the five senses. Okay? They, um, they, they, have, so they, they have that, and then they have a natural walk. They walk according to the course of this world. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3 says, And you have he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The unsaved natural man walks that way. Uh, he's without hope, without Christ and God in this world. Ephesians 2, 11, 2, Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. So here is, and the last thing in his natural walk, his understanding is darkened. Okay? Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 says, I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is it in them because of the blindness of their heart. Okay? And uh, we're going to cover real quick the carnal. The babe in the Lord. Not a newborn babe. Somebody who just stayed a babe. They've stayed carnal. They should have grown up, but they're carnal. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, through verse 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal. Even as unto babes in Christ... I have fed you with milk and not meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, and neither yet are ye now able. For ye are carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, and not and are you not carnal and walk as men, the Amplified says mere men, mere unchanged men. You're walking as mere unchanged men. They should have grown up, but they haven't. They decided to stay babes. These are the people that always causing trouble in the church. They're always running their mouth. They're always splitting stuff up. They're always getting groups unto themselves. They're always just disrupting everything. They're just, they're just wherever they go, there's, there's just upheaval. Okay? He's not talking about newborn banks. He's talking about people who have not grown up. Remember, Peter said, newborn banks should desire the sincere milk that they may grow. Uh, they are creatures of the flesh. Uh, Mo Moffat's historical New Testament from 1901 says that the carnal man is a creature of the flesh. You know, their flesh just governs them. Another translation says he is body ruled. They demonstrate fleshly attitudes, backbiting, bitterness, jealousy, strife, division, envying, uh, and selfishness. And they'll pit people in the church against the pastor and against leadership. And they'll gather little followings unto themselves. And they'll create their little, their little team of, you know, reinforcing each other and that kind of stuff. They walk as mere men. The Amplified says this, they walk as mere unchanged men. We are to grow and allow the new nature in us to change us and cause us to grow. A carnal man stays the same and does not grow. Now, they change churches regularly so that they look like they're spiritual. See, people can come in and look spiritual and they're just as absolutely unspiritual as a day is long. They, 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 can, make, they can put on the show. But over time, time, see, time is the test. Consistency is the test. You know, they can blow wind up your skirt and talk about how, you know, talk, and, and talk the talk. But at some point, they can't, they can't continue walking the walk because they're not, they're not changed. They're not changing, okay? Uh, that, that's, that's babyhood stage or, or lack of growing stage. Um, they need to grow out of carnality. The only way to, grow out of carna to get out of carnality is to grow. 
desire the milk so you can grow. Then you step into some meat, you step into other things. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.